what you had been doing, particularly during the pandemic, and what you plan to do going forward. So, welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Blanche, and thank you, uh, Community Board 7. It's great to be uh, with all of you again. Great to see everybody. Uh, and I am joined by my wonderful colleagues uh, from the libraries in the district. And uh, we'll be looking to, to all of them quite a bit throughout this meeting to uh, you know, provide a lot of specifics and details about things happening at the branches. And so we're all very excited to, uh, to be here with you all this evening. I think uh, you know, we'll just I'll start with some introductory uh, updates, some general uh, system-wide updates, and then you know, as folks have questions or as my colleagues from the branches would like to weigh in with specifics, uh, we'll, we'll just continue that way. So uh, yes, as Blanche noted, uh, all of our libraries are restoring service <clears throat> on July 6th, which is very, very, very exciting. Um, keep in mind, you know, this doesn't apply to, there are some branches that are closed for like full on renovations. Uh, that doesn't apply to, to anybody here. Uh, but so those, those branches will remain closed if they already had major projects going on, you know, like we have the Carnegie renovations at a branch like Hunts Point, for example, you know, that's, that's like a year long thing. So those branches aren't included, but for the most part, everything's reopening. Uh, we're going to be restoring full service, uh, which is great. Uh, and so that includes the full complement of services, which is, you know, general space use programs, classes. Uh, and a lot of this is going to be incremental as well. So, you know, as space starts to allow more, we'll provide more programs or more people will be able to attend the programs. Uh, you know, it's, it's less an issue of safety, which is great now than it is of resources. You know, we need to get ramped back up. We need to make sure we have enough staff everywhere. Uh, so um, it's not just going to be a quick snap of the fingers, but it is going to be, you know, we're, we're shooting for full restoration and, and, like I said, more and more, you'll just see more and more It'll as, uh, as we proceed. So some of the things to look forward to, uh, specifically that are happening this summer and even into the fall, uh, you know, my colleagues uh, in library services have been working on a robust outdoor programming plan, which I'm sure some of them can, can speak to, activities like outdoor story times, for example. Uh, we're gonna be restoring bookmobile service as well, which, uh, Again, I mean, I keep using the word exciting, but it is very exciting. Uh, it's gonna be in mid-July, hopefully. And that's gonna be great uh, in particular for some of these branches that I was talking about that have to be closed for a longer period of time. Uh, the bookmobiles can kind of help provide temporary service uh, for those folks. Uh, and then of course, summer reading is about to launch. Uh, that's gonna launch uh, beginning of next month. Uh, the, uh, we're calling it Summer Learning. And a big part of summer reading, uh, an initiative that I was involved in last year is the book kit giveaway uh, aspect of, of summer reading. And so we're going to be giving out backpacks and tote bags that have books, uh, reading activities inside them to uh, children a, from birth to through high school, I believe. And they're available in different languages as well. And these are just gonna be at the branches and folks can, you know, patrons can come and pick them up uh, but there's also going to be a side effort that I'm going to be leading where a smaller number of books will be working with some elected officials to do some distributions in communities as well. Uh, that was something that I did last year because, you know, we, the branches were closed last year. Uh, so uh, we're, we're going to bring that back on a smaller scale because we don't want to interfere too much with what the branches already have going on. And we want folks to come to the branches. So. Uh, I'll be sharing information on that. That'll be in coordination with you know, state assembly members, council members, et cetera. So very excited about that as well. And then there's going to be some fun uh, exhibits too uh, over the summer. So uh, some of our research libraries are going to be doing different types of exhibits in you know, the education space or the cultural space. Uh, a couple years ago, we had the treasures exhibit where we put a lot of our sort of historic uh, aspects of our collections on display. I think there's gonna be something similar to that, but that's still very much in the works. So that's at a high level. Uh, I did also wanna quickly talk about each branch in Community Board 7, just to, so we can revisit that and make sure we all know what's going on at those different branches. So uh, the easiest one to talk about is Riverside, which has been open uh, and, and it's open for 
uh, phase two service, which, you know, that included internet access, computer access, printing, scanning, et cetera. And of course, Riverside will go, will join all the other branches on July 6th. Uh, and then, of course, you all have uh, St. Agnes. Now, St. Agnes was a branch that there's a number of branches that they were already closed uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, and then we wanted to work with the city in repurposing branches a lot of different ways during the COVID-19 crisis. And so some of these branches doubled as uh, COVID testing centers. Some of them became polling sites. And then, of course, uh, St. Agnes was a branch that became a learning lab where uh, it provided childcare, which was a huge support for uh, parents and guardians and families. Um, so that branch is going to be converted back uh, into a library uh, very soon. The school year ends June 30th. So it may take a little bit of extra time to get it uh, fully up to speed as a library, but it really should not be any later than mid to late July. Uh, so that's the update on St. Anne. And of course, Bloomingdale, I know, is always a very hot topic uh, in this community. And I am happy to report that the $3 million investment in that branch, the renovation, is fully complete. And it's going to be done in time for the July 6th opening as well. And just as a friendly reminder, uh, yeah, seeing the applauses, uh, that, that renovation includes a lot of different things. There's a new, old, brand new, dedicated team room teen room, excuse me. Uh, you have upgrades to the second floor bathrooms, uh, a new roof, new floors, new carpeting, uh, new water fountains, uh, repainting of the reading rooms. So uh, really happy about that. We're actually sending a separate communication about that to both patrons and electeds next week, uh, just because we know that you know this has been a long time coming. So that's the update on Bloomingdale. And then I also wanted to cover the Library for Performing Arts as well, because that is uh, they do a lot of fun, exciting stuff, but it is also a circulation uh, branch too. Uh, so one thing I wanted to mention is that they have this very exciting uh, collaboration with the Lincoln Center, the, uh, the green space. Uh, and out there, there is an outdoor reading room uh, where there are free books available. And then there's also an outdoor grab and go space there where you can do holds and returns, uh, which is very cool. Uh, LPA is also doing tech kits. So they're putting together kits for artists and musicians uh, that include everything from computers to microphones to keyboards to other equipment that they may need to you know, put together, whether it's a documentary or a, or a music video or, or whatever it may be. Obviously these are for rent, um, but we're very excited to be, to be moving forward with that. So those are just a few updates on uh, Library for Performing Arts. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about budget later uh, in the meeting, but um, a couple other things I do want to mention, and hopefully, you know, with my my colleagues from library services, we can talk more about, but just kind of shoot them as headlines for now. Uh, we're changing our after school model uh, this coming year, so it's not going to be enrollment anymore. It's going to be drop in. And the reason we're doing that is because we want to reach more kids. We want more children to be able to come to our branches and access our programs. Again, I have more info on that, but we'll talk later. I know that uh, Jennifer wanted to talk about the STEAM kits, so we can get into that later. Um, and then also just briefly wanted to mention this new Center for Educators and Schools, CES. That's something that's going to be coming down the line as well. Uh, that's like a, it's going to be like a clearinghouse really for educators where they can, you know, all of our collections, whether they be archived or data or just circulation are going to be centralized in one place. And it's really the idea there is to help uh, educators be able to access information uh, for their students or, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, and it's also going to host a wide range of fellowships and internships and public <laughs> So that's sort of the, uh, those are the headlines. And like I said, I uh, really leaning on uh, my friends from library services, we can get into some details and also looking forward to talking a little bit about the uh, budget picture uh, later in this meeting. Thank you very much. Lance, do we want to, uh, to keep moving here? Um, Do we still have I'll put it on mute. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, I was asking Amar to expand a bit on those special services that the library provides 
in, in nursing homes and offbeat places that we don't think of, like nursing homes and even um, for in, in prisons and so on. We seldom hear about that. Um, is there anything you could tell us about those ongoing um, activities? Yeah, so I don't have information on nursing homes off the top of my head. Uh, perhaps one of my colleagues might, but definitely in prisons, we do have a program uh, where we, uh, I believe it was with visitation and uh, allowing uh, incarcerated individuals to be able to read read books with people who are visiting them, friends and family, et cetera. Uh, obviously that's been put on hold, but that's one of the things we're very excited to, uh, to get ramped up again. Uh, there's a lot that we do with uh, schools and preparing students to, to enter college. And I think at the last meeting, uh, either Ashley or Jennifer uh, talked a little bit more about the details on that. Um, and then, of course, there's career counseling that we provide, uh, you know, one on one career counseling, which is very popular during the pandemic, uh, resume work, uh, that sort of thing. And then also, uh, you know, one of our very popular partnerships, too, was, again, so a lot of this is still getting geared back up for in person, but over the pandemic was our partnership with BrainFuse, a tutoring service. Uh, which was super helpful for parents who, and guardians who were working, uh, you know, within the challenges and framework of distance learning. And BrainFuse is actually going to be one of the tenets of the after-school program too for tutoring. So, uh, I don't know if any of my colleagues uh, from uh, Library Services might want to add anything about any anything I might have missed. Okay, thank you. Um, Mark, are you monitoring any? Hands up for anything. Well, my Blanche, my question for you was: Did we did we want to keep going, or do we want to stop for questions now? How would you? Um, if we have questions, why don't we take them? Okay, I think Kristen has a question. Yes, thank you. Hey, um, hi, Mir. I'm super excited to hear about these centers for educators. So I'd actually like to know a little bit more about them, like where they are, when they're going to start operating, a little bit more of the details, because I think it's an amazing and important resource. Sure. Yeah, definitely. I mean, so it's it's not a physical place. It will be kind of a uh, virtual clearinghouse, you could say, or a resource. Uh, it's still in nascent stages. Uh, so it's kind of, I'm kind of just teasing it right now. Uh, but I do expect it to be a bit more defined uh, by the fall. So I think there will be a little bit more information. Uh, but right. for now, yeah, I don't have too much beyond what I shared at, at this stage. Right. And getting it up because the fall will probably be pretty challenging for educators this year. So mm -hmm. getting it up to speed to bring them resources for the opening of the new school year or at yeah. least early on in the new school year. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> It sounds great, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? I actually have one. You actually said you, you said you were gonna do outreach to patrons. Um, is that via email? What are, how are you, given that you guys have a uh, big change um, from where we've been for so long, what are yeah. kind of your plans for getting the word out, especially to people who may not be, um, as easy to reach yet will be sure. really, really uh, interested in knowing that, that, that we're, they're reopening. Absolutely. So we do have a patron mailing list for each branch that is catered to, you know, specific folks who go to that branch. So that's going out. Uh, that email is coming from our communications team. But then when my team also does, which I, we like to think helps cover some of the blind spots. I hope it does, which is we also go ahead and message all of the electeds uh, for a branch. So uh, everybody from council member to state assembly to state senate, and then they go ahead and they put it on their they put it in their communication outlets as well. And so it goes in their newsletters. Sometimes it goes in their flyers. Some they might even make uh, phone calls. So that's typically those two are the are the primary means of getting the word out to patrons. Okay. 
Um, Robert is up, I think. Yeah, hi, uh, <clears throat> Blanche and uh, Courtney. Before pre-pandemic times, uh, when I was between computers, I would spend a lot of time at uh, Bloomingdale, a lot, because my work. And, uh, and not so much social media, but doing my real estate. And so I get my 45 minutes in the morning, then I go back and come back in the afternoon and take my 45 minutes. And one of the things that was a feature of that particular branch, and I think it's really all of them, was what I consider to be a hyper community service that the library system provides the community in the way of providing access to uh, residents in homeless programs. Because part of, from, from my recollection, when I was doing uh, managing a homeless program, one of the things you do is job de development skills and all of that stuff. So you teach uh, these young people, uh, these were mostly young adults, but into their old age also, how to prepare a resume and uh, uh, some computer skills and the whole thing. <clears throat> so that apparently this is still the, this is still the case because they would come into, and you're queuing up along with everybody else. So there's not a queue for homeless people who live in residential programs and not a queue for regular civilians, as I say. Everybody, you take your ticket and then you wait and then you wait for the vacancy at the computer and then you get your 45 minutes. I think it was 45 minutes. And the, end, the point is that this is such a vital service. And so I had raised a question, I'm not sure where, it might've been at that time, you know, the. Uh, on, my, on the board and health and human services may not have been, uh, <clears throat> that there be a liaison between the branches and the local programs. So for example, Bloomingdale's has a, several, you know, they, they have uh, programs that are local and where their residents come to use that nearest uh, library facility, but then other parts of the city have the same <clears throat> kind of uh, use. So I had always wanted to see a liaison that works for New York Public Library to work hand in hand with these various residential programs and the training component of the programs that your uh, resident, uh, you have the job development program and then uh, they're gonna come for access to us. And uh, so question of the software, where to go and to kind of bump up their skill level in the use of the computer. <clears throat> now, of course, it's, as equally important really uh, is the recreational use uh, in the way of uh, uh, social media, the, uh, what is the, whatever the correct term is, Facebook, Twitter, um, uh, Instagram, and, and because they're not very, very important. You know, even if you're just fishing for news, you're not gonna go to the New York Times website all the time and less and less, as you know, because you want real time news. Something is happening, comes to your attention, what's happening in uh, Afghanistan, what's happening in Miami, you say you're interested in the collapse that happened last night, the whole thing. So you go to Twitter, you get real time coverage of whatever station is transmitting, as opposed to waiting for, and this is my bias and you'll excuse me, manage news from whatever the primary source that is popular in your area. So anyway, so that young man, I feel, I can't see my screen. So Amir? Amir, yes. Amir, I got it uh, close. Is that close enough? It is, it absolutely is. So my bucket list <laughs> for, for this is that you set up a, um, a network of liaison for the different uh, branches to their local residential programs for homeless and develop programs. So that's 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 my best wish. So that's the comment that that so my comment is a request. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, I mean that's uh you bring up a great point. I mean we do have all of these uh wonderful programs that provide everything from computer literacy uh, to English language, to uh, software and website development, uh, targeting adults. And, uh, but I think, yeah, there, there would be a lot of value into uh, focusing specifically on the communities uh, that you're addressing. So uh, yeah, I'd be happy to raise this with our outreach and programming team and, uh, and see what they think. You know, because the, the interesting thing is that they're engaged 
So, you know, you get a couple of young teenagers and they're always quite lovely to have around, even, even though I raised one. So it's not kind of an oxymoron, but <laughs> sometimes you have to tell them to shut up, you know, <laughs> and go outside, you know, go someplace, just go, you know. Mm -hmm. But the people that come in from the residential programs, they're focused. They are focused. They're not there to play or that, you know, they're, they're there to, um, they may even have assignments, go to the library and access a certain job site or something. So they may even okay. come to their assignments. Okay. So anyway, that's my whole point, uh, Courtney. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Mark has his hand up. Yeah. I'd, um a quick thought, and maybe you've already thought of this, um, but especially with respect to the reopening of the libraries, um, which obviously is very important and may not be well understood at this point. Um, one of the things, and it kind of plays, uh, it kind of dovetails on what Robert was just sharing, um, that getting the word out to some of the neighborhood folks that um, rely so heavily on, on access to all the resources there food banks and senior centers might be places where in-person flyers would go a long way. Uh, just mm -hmm. dropping off a bunch of flyers at a food bank, um, which they could then just stuff into the bag that, that uh, goes along with the, the patron. Um, and senior centers, which thank God are starting to reopen, um, would be, I think, fertile ground for uh, folks. And especially with respect to Bloomingdale, uh, which has been closed for a long time, boy, I would love to see them have the first crack at the beautiful new facility. Um, it's been my experience that when one group takes ownership of a space, others may or may not feel as welcome there. So it'd be great if those groups could feel like they own the place uh, going in. Those are my thoughts, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Both you and Courtney make very, very good points about you know getting so much of us reopening on such a grand scale this quickly, uh, we're even ahead of uh, Queens and Brooklyn actually, uh, is that we know that there are certain folks who can't, have not been able to access our services. And we, we are trying to reach those people. That's, that's a central challenge right now. So uh, yeah, you all bring up great points and I will definitely run that back and see what we can do about getting some physical notifications out there in the communities and see, see what kind of ideas we can come up with. Um, from our comms team. I also would just running along that, I also would just point out, let's not forget about the about the, the teens you just mentioned, the brand new teen room. Um, and so uh, maybe liaising, liaising with, um, with yeah. some of the folks who are running the summer programming would be helpful because school will be out, but they'll be still in contact with the kids um, and just kind of using that as a resource and a connection. I also, my other idea, is that and and um, Julian and uh, Mark may say no, but Link NYC um, strikes me as a way to kind of target. Julian's already smiling, so it's always my. Um, um, but just as another another option that can be very highly localized and targeted um, to really make sure people are seeing it, and know that these buildings are back open and the services that they haven't had. Sure. Yeah, it sounds great. Um, Emma, you mentioned having um, exhibits of, you know, historical things you have. Is this down at 7th Central at the, in the 40s, or will they go to different branches? Uh, oh, the exhibits, yeah. So those will likely be in our, our research spaces uh, yeah. or some of our more, you could say, high-profile locations. So, for example... You know, the Stephen A. Schwartzman building uh, on 42nd Street by Bryant Park with the lines in front of it. Right. Or uh, also we have this new branch that just opened. Uh, it used to be Mid-Manhattan Library. It got a full, uh, full on renovation. It just reopened. It's got a rooftop, a lot of uh, spaces for bands to practice music, a lot of really fun, uh, exciting stuff. So that, that could be a space, for example, where you may see an exhibit or the Schomburg Center uh, as well. These are the types of spaces, uh, Library for Performing Arts, I wouldn't be surprised as well, where you, where you may see these types of exhibits. Okay. Any other questions? If not, we can go to our branches. Um, I do want to, uh, uh, Blanche, if it's okay, I did just want to briefly uh, cover the budget real quick, because I know you had asked me about that in your email. Would that be okay? Oh, please. 
you know, we're we're in um, district need statement time. Right. And, yeah. And you contributed quite a bit to our last year budget request. As I recall, you worked out. I don't think I don't know if it's worked out, but we had submitted um, for a second bookmobile because the bookmobile in Manhattan was new as of last year. And we had the question whether one bookmobile could cover all the needs that we had in Manhattan. So um, that was just one submission you made budgetarily, but we'll be happy to take anything else you have in mind now. Please. Sure. Yeah, so I guess there were, there were two points I wanted to make. The first one is kind of where the library is right now from a strategic perspective. Uh, like I said, our, our challenge right now is we learned a lot during the pandemic about the value of digital and remote services and things we could be doing differently or things that are very effective uh, that, or you know, the, the impact of folks who are on the wrong side of the digital divide and, and don't have access to a lot of the digital or digital virtual presence. Um, and so much of those lessons learned are things we want to maintain that we want to keep doing. We want to keep working with brain fuse. Like I said, now it's going to be part of the after school program. We want to keep being able to digitize uh, research collections uh, through our scan and deliver service and be able to send, send that to somebody. You know, that's something we couldn't do before, you know, necessity breeds invention, right? So we want to maintain a lot of these things we came up with. Uh, and you know the Tech Connect classes were so valuable. Uh, you know, I remember I would send those out, and every time I would put the list together, it would already be full. So I'd have to take them off the list because people couldn't sign up anymore. So these these are all things that we weren't exactly doing before, and we started doing. Uh, but at the same time, like I said, we have all these people that we lost that we were connecting with in person, and they're it's so valuable that we reconnect with those patrons. So we're in an interesting position right now where. We want to restore our service to what it was while maintaining these lessons learned. And, you know, one of the biggest parts of that is, is going to be, like I said, full speed ahead with full restoration, but also doubling down on digital. So I did want to mention that, that that's part of where our heads are at right now. Uh, with regards to the budget, uh, you know, the, the FY22 budget, believe it or not, has still not been finalized. So we're kind of sitting right now waiting to see what's going to happen. Uh, typically, it's it's happened by now, uh, so we haven't had a chance to really move forward with our specific uh, priorities. Uh, I will say we're we're facing a potential cut of a uh, 22 million uh, system wide, and uh, you know we're hoping system that meaning Manhattan. I'm sorry. System meaning entire Manhattan. Well, so NYPL is in the Bronx, Manhattan, and Staten Island, so it would be right. those three boroughs. So. Uh, that is a possibility. We're hoping that that doesn't happen. We're hoping that money gets restored, uh, but we really don't know. So any cut to funding, uh, you know, that'll have an that'll have an adverse impact on our services. So that's something we're just we're waiting to see what's going to happen with that. Um, and then of course there's capital, so stuff like the Bloomingdale renovation or or whatever it is. We've requested 50 million uh, system wide on that front. Uh, we didn't have any capital needs. Uh, beyond what was already going on in uh, Community Board 7 last year. So I don't expect anything to change there. Um, but, you know, we would really appreciate your input, honestly, on, you know, other things that you want to see uh, at your branches, since we're still at a point where we're waiting for the budget. Uh, obviously, the thank you, Blanche, for reminding me of the bookmobile. I think that's a, a, a very reasonable request. I know that the basement has been a long time uh, aspiration uh, for this board. And uh, as I've shared previously, that's right now that's being used by facilities, but I think it's totally reasonable to include that as a budget priority as well, uh, because I, I agree with you all that, that that would be a great use of space, particularly uh, right now. Uh, so that's really the, um, yeah, that's the budget report. So I wanted to make sure I, I shared that. And, and as soon as the budget comes out and we have a clearer picture, I'll be, I'll be back in touch. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back to the digital needs, well, the need for that whole area. Are you talking about staff? Are you talking about equipment? Just what what to resume that offering right. and build on it? Basically being able to continue providing digital and 
virtual services at the same level that they were provided during the pandemic. Uh, uh, so being able to provide just as many Tech Connect classes or one-on-one -on -one career counseling or virtual resource research consultations or brain fused tutoring sessions uh, or our virtual book club, you know, so many of these things that we started doing right away in the pandemic. The other thing I wanted to mention too is we're one of our top priorities is enhancing our internet access. So we're involved in a Wi-Fi uh, pilot program right now where we would be working with the city to strengthen our Wi-Fi network so that they can go out into the communities so that you know folks who are a little further away from the library can still log into the NYPL network. So Wi-Fi access, digital divide, uh, that's a huge, huge priority too. Okay. I will we'll undoubtedly get back to you maybe next week for some more specifics, okay? Yeah, uh, that sounds great. Thank you. Uh, so we have Roberta with her hand up. I just had one question. You mean just kind of working with them to strengthen Wi-Fi access and network access citywide just in general for users? You don't mean for your staff who are going out into the field or the bookmobiles or you mean just in general being a stakeholder in better Wi-Fi access for? In general, yes, but also one of the new things we're doing within that general goal is looking into expanding the geographic range of each branch's Wi-Fi network. Okay. So, so more okay. and more people said more and more people, they're just sitting at home, but maybe they live like three quarters of a mile away from the Bloomingdale branch and they can log in for free. Uh, Understood, okay. Great, thank you. Roberta? Mm -hmm. that, that is so important because, you know, we, we, we know that too many children don't have access to Wi-Fi um, and, and have fallen way behind. And, and I just wanted to, uh, what both Emma and, and Blanche have said about the uh, Bloomingdale library, how much we need that, that space. Um, we asked for it, I think, five years ago, and, and it's just such incredible space and would be such a gift to the community. Um, and, and we will be having new elected officials in office in the next six months. So hopefully they, they will be on board to, um, to do this. Um, I, I just wanted to thank the, the library so much. You're, you've become such a vital part of community in ways that, that librarians 50 years ago could never have imagined. Um, it, it's just so important. And I wanted to thank you for all the wonderful work you guys are doing. Thank you. Okay, any other hands? If not- nope, that looks I, like it, yep. Okay, why don't we start alphabetically? Well, uh, Jennifer isn't here, is she? Jennifer yeah. is here. Uh, she's uh, as Ash. She's one of the Ashleys, though. Hi there. Hear me? Okay. Oh, Ashley. I'm going in alphabetical order. Um, Agnes, Saint Agnes. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Yeah. I'm. I met. Um, this is Jennifer from Saint Agnes. Um, I'm so glad to have the opportunity to come to the meeting. <laughs> And speak with you. Um, yeah, I guess I can just say that you know I've just been very impressed with how you know you know you had asked um, how you know what we've been up to, and I just wanted to mention that I'm very impressed with how the staff have reached out to our community virtually. So you know we offered virtual class visits, story times, STEM and or STEAM uh, programs. You know where kids could learn how to create digital music and pixel art animation, for example, and um, within the first two weeks of shutting down, the, the children's librarians created a Padlet, which is just like, which is a great um, curated list of links to really fund also educational web resources that really supported uh, parents as well as educators, um, you know, during the pandemic, during the shutdown. Um, so the, the Padlet includes links to family focused initiatives like summer reading, as well as uh, video content that the librarians created, um, including these book hypes, which were these short 
videos promoting titles that the libraries uh, curated and recommended. Um, also virtual story time, some reading activities. Um, so I can send that information. I can send the link to the Padlet that we shared with parents and educators. And I also wanted to mention that our library's Instagram page was featured on West Side Rag. And uh, yeah, the, the article, the blog entry just talked about how local librarians gave remote advice and suggestions while the doors stay closed. So yeah, we, we really did our best to reach out and we're, we're really, really excited to have the opportunity to come back in person, you know, when, when, that, uh, when the time is right and hopefully mid-July. So yeah, that's all I have to say. So thank you. <laughs> uh, Jennifer, am I wrong in hearing um, that at St. Agnes you had done um, it was a vaccination site, or is this my imagination? Oh, was yeah, the library yeah. used for? We're actually a learning lab. Yeah, so we, um, because we were unable to reopen, um, we we right. had, we you know make sure the space was being used. So yeah, we were uh, a lab for um, the, for the schools, and um, maybe Amir has a little more information about that. But I know that um, the DOE has been in the building for a while and they plan to, um, you know, at the end of the school year, which is, you know, in a few days, um, exit the building and hopefully we can start getting ready to reopen. Do, do you know what programs or activities they had? Well, I know that they, yeah, I, I, you know, honestly, I don't know the specifics about that, but I do know that they, the DOE was using the space to support, you know, educational, you know, to support their programs um, okay. virtually. So that's all I know. <laughs> okay, good but yeah, I can get more yeah, information can, and get um, back to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I can briefly add, it, it basically served as a, a vessel for daycare, uh, to put it in super layman's terms. Like it was, it was a place where child care providers could, uh, you know, we weren't doing the child care. Child care providers were able to use that space uh, and parents uh, left their kids there uh, for, for daycare. And yet, just like Jennifer said, um, it'll be, we're gonna be converting it as soon as uh, June 30th hits and hopefully mid to late July, it'll be open again. So the library wasn't totally closed. It was repurposed, I think is the word of the day. Got it. Yeah. Very yeah, exactly. was, uh, uh -huh. Sorry, go ahead. I heard a voice, but okay. Very interesting. Very good. Okay. Anything else um, relative to St. Agnes? Okay. Keeping alphabetical, Drew? Uh, hello, everyone. Um, Hi. This is my first time at the meeting, so I'll just introduce myself. I'm Drew Berner. I'm one of the adult librarians at Bloomingdale. Uh, I just want to reiterate how excited we are to be back. It's long overdue, especially at Bloomingdale, as we kind of got, we've been closed on twice as long as everyone else with the yeah, innovations. Um, as my colleague mentioned, you know, a few of the things, the dedicated new teen room, the new bathrooms, which we are quite excited about as we had often got complaints about those, uh, roof replacement and the new drinking fountains. Um, I don't think you mentioned yet, we, all, we also got all new computers for um, the public as well as staff. Uh, that includes computers in the teen room, so it increases our uh, computers we have, as well as new laptops, uh, new printers, new copy machine. Um, so we are ready as best we can to meet the needs of the community. Uh, you know, right now we want to have uh, programs on site as of right now, but we'll be continuing to have um, virtual programs via Google Meet. And um, we're planning to have story times in the park. Uh, we're, we're working with St. Agnes with that, and we're just excited to be back. We, we The staff came back this week to start to get the staff came back this week um, to start getting the branch operational, uh, getting the collection ready, and we're excited to have the doors open. Yeah, and I'm a neighbor, and I see a couple of our committee members who are also big users of Bloomingdale's are with us, I think. We are very excited to have you back. Um, now, the teen room, um, Amar had mentioned a $3 million budget, but the teen room budget 
was separate, and that was approved years ago. But that's a whole other issue. Okay. Welcome back. We are happy to have you. Okay. Um, and we have uh, River. Riverside has been very busy. So let us hear from Riverside. Hello, everyone. I uh, hope you could hear me. I'm Thaddeus Krupo, an adult librarian at the Riverside branch. We've been very happy to be the one branch that's open on the west side. We have gotten up to know a lot of people in the area, and we've heard loud and clear we want Bloomingdale open. So thank you. <laughs> <It's open. laughs> but uh, a lot of people want, to, want their own neighborhood branch, and it's wonderful to have our uh, our, our branches back together. So we're gonna be working as a team as make the Gold Coast shine again. Um, the Riverside branch has been having its computers open. We have our collections open for browsing. We have been getting uh, a lot of folks back. We've been spreading the word. We cannot go out really too far right now, but I, as Amar said, we expect that to change rapidly. So we're preparing to hit the places that usually we don't see people coming from. And there are senior centers around us. And if you have any in particular that we can go to, when the time comes, we'll be happy to go to go to those services. We want now, how would you go? What, what would you take to, say, a senior center? Well, we could take them and say we have virtual programs. I already run a virtual book discussion that's pretty popular. And we could show them how to get linked on. We have books by mail which a librarian will ask them reference questions and we'll send them books every month for free. There are audio books that they can go to. We could show them how to use a lot of services that are online now, which as more put, are really robust. They really came up and they hit it out of the park with the uh, services that are online right now. And we really want to promote them. They're very good. One of the things I wanted to bring up though, I think Amar, you could, uh, talk about this more. The libraries are going to be, again, cooling centers. Is that true? I, I uh, so, yeah, that's, we did that last summer. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have not heard about the plan for this summer yet, okay. uh, to be honest with you. Um, I don't recall if we're, the, any of the libraries in, in this district for cooling centers last year. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will, uh, I'll check on that because I don't, I think we rolled that out a little later in the summer, but let me see, because if a library is already open, I'm not sure, because we, that was one of our other uses. Like yeah. if a branch was already closed, it became a cooling center. Mm -hmm. um, so that might be a little bit of a different landscape this year. I can't imagine that they would turn a library that was already open uh, into an a cooling center exclusively. I don't, I don't think that's on the table, uh, but let me, uh, I'll need to look into that. Um, if I could just interject. Um, yeah. I mean, basically once we're open for full service, what will we'll pretty much all be cooling centers is my understanding. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Sort of so like, yeah, as the library, it's also a cooling center kind of. Mm -hmm. uh, gotcha. Yeah, exactly. Yes, I just wanted to bring that up though. Our branch is nice and cool. So if you people can go in there and start to cool down and when we open up for, for fuller service, we'll have more seating or we will have seating. We'll have, um, our young adult librarians, they have been going to their schools virtually and they have been popular. We have schools coming to us already with over a hundred library cards, getting new students all lined up and ready to go. So They've been hitting their schools hard and we're welcoming them back. Um, they've been doing the library cards and they do have plenty of programs that are already going out. We have our uh, take home kits that the librarians created so they have some art. Those are ready every Saturday and usually by one o'clock in the afternoon, they're all gone. She can't create enough of these kits. So we know we're popular and it's all ready for them. And the young adult librarian has been creating uh, virtual programs. And one of them she's proud of is the comic chat where they talk about their uh, the comics they're reading that, that month and they usually theme it out. 
And I think the next one is going to be July 15th at three o'clock. And it's a virtual Google meet. Anyone could really just register and join. And that's going to be about travel comics and disability pride comics. But they take a lot of pride in doing some of those things. And I also want to plug in for all the libraries is they're going to have this summer virtual summer camp. And registration is going to start tomorrow. So what that is, they have a summer camp. We, they have little activities that are going on every day for the kids. It's really a lot of fun to get some virtual badges and they do some reading and they do some find and hide and seek. So it's something else that's being done. It, it was all put together on the fly and now it's really taken off. It's just something that we just like to do and we like to do it a lot. So that's it for number five. Yeah, do you have an age range for the summer camps? Um, I'm going to add the link right now so that you have it and you could look at it because I don't know for sure. So I just added the link into the chat about that and the registration will be tomorrow. Okay. Um, so you could look at that to see uh, exactly what the ages are for. Fine. Thank you. Okay. Um, now you went through, um, I'm thinking money wise and budget wise, you had a fairly thorough redo about five years ago. So I don't think you have any major needs budgetarily, capital capital needs particularly. I, uh, don't. I think Amar could speak more on the capital needs, but I know since we're in a, a building, the maintenance in that building takes care of it, but I don't know of any real capital needs that we would have. Okay. Yeah, just to uh, confirm that the Right now, we're in a good place with capital needs uh, in this district. Uh, but again, um, the I know the basement in uh, in Bloomingdale, of course. It's an obsession with me, Amar. Yeah, no, I know, and that's okay. Ever, the people are aware of it, and that's good. And I want to keep reminding them. <laughs> um, okay. But otherwise, I think we're we're in a good place right now, unless there's something uh, anyone would like to bring to the table. Okay. Okay, any questions, ideas for our libraries, especially our new members? Oh, um, okay. I'll jump in if I can um, with the budget hat on. Um, so it sounds like the big push on the expense side is uh, to close the $22 million, um, what I'll call staffing gap or, or operational budget. Um, or, or whatever remains of that. Um, I guess the, the question I wanna ask is that pre-pandemic, so maybe I'm going back two years, my, um, uh, I'm, I don't think I'm alone in, in losing track of time uh, for having missed a year in between, but maybe it was two years ago where there was an actual incentive or push by um, Amr's uh, predecessor to actually increase the, the head count that uh, instead of just trying to hold our own against the erosion of services that we were trying to go back to um, um, uh, more research librarians and more um, uh, uh, other circulating librarians, uh, reference librarians, I should say, um, is, is does the $22 million represent that kind of an expansion of service or is that simply trying to restore what people are proposing to cut I think Amr is uh, muted. Oh yeah, thank you for that. Uh, the 22 million is money that we lost during uh, the previous fiscal year, uh, I believe. Uh, yeah. right. so we're, we're trying to get, we're trying to restore that cut. And so that wasn't, from what I understand, I'm not, I'm not in, on the finance team, but from what I understand at least from our asks is that you know, that that's our, it just kind of comes out of our expense budget. So it could go, I don't know exactly how that was accounted for. Um, so it really could have been, it could have gone to any, any specific area or uh, accounting item. Um, with regards to increasing headcount, I mean, that's totally something that would be, that would come from the expense budget. So that would be, it would be relevant to that for sure. So if that was something that you wanted to include in your budget request it would be totally applicable to to the expense and it would come out of it would come out of that pot 
Okay, got it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, is Paul Fisher still with us? Okay, because he's a regular user and is often very concerned about the state yes. of he's, blooming. He's Blanche, he's here, and then Roberta also has her hand up as well. Okay, but Paul doesn't have his hand up, so there, I don't there he does. Now. Please, Paul. Um, I want to thank Mark for the shout out to Bloomingdale. My neighbors really depend on that. And uh, anyway, thank you. I thought you would have wanted to comment on that. <laughs> I never see Paul unless he brings up Bloomingdale. In the middle of 96th Street traffic, Paul will say, what's happening at Bloomingdale? Now you know. OK, you should be happy. OK, good to see you. Only took us nine years to get a restroom. I think it was eight. <laughs> okay, uh, Roberta. So I think libraries this year are even more important than ever before, because not only are they centers of, of what libraries are, which is a place you can go and get a book, a place where you can read, a place where you feel safe. They are centers for Wi-Fi. They, our children and our seniors have been... Um, disproportionately uh, uh, uncomfortable. I, I'm not sure what the right word to say. Um, during the pandemic, they've not had access to Wi-Fi. They've not had access to other human contact. They, the, 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 the libraries have become the center of the community for, for a great many people. And, and I think libraries need to be um, a, a, one of our major priorities this year for, for our district needs. And, and I, I, it, it, they're so important of the, the work that you guys do in libraries to help everybody, but especially those of our people who are, are more marginalized, who don't have access to Wi-Fi, who don't have access to reading, who don't have access to so many services and we really have to rethink this year. Thank you, Roberta. Um, you know, it, it's very gratifying to go into the library. And as I say, Bloomingdale is my neighbor. And you see your age range, depending on what time you go. Yeah, people use it to go. I know people who go in every day to read the New York Times or any other newspapers. And the, the service services that libraries provide people are not aware of. Um, and I think they, they're they underestimated and we thank you all. Any other comments while we have? Um, Amar or our branch managers, just a question. Do you have any sense at this point as to where the, the three branches in CB7, how we stack up in terms of program attendance and well, it's hard because we've gone through a pandemic, so everything was closed down. But um, we have always been a, a leader in terms of um, our three libraries in terms of program attendance and um, and selection of books. But uh, we will hope to build that up again, again once the pandemic is over. Okay. Um, once, uh, once I send uh, the information for the district priorities, uh, I do hope to have some kind of data on on that uh, for you. Oh, for then, sir. I know that we've been reporting some of that to the city uh, in a modified way. So I do hope to have at least a partial picture of that. Okay. Um, I'd say whatever you send to the city, if it's appropriate, send it to us as well. We sure. need our egos boosted ever so often. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, good. Uh, okay. Thank you all for coming. And um, I apologize for the change of date. We lost, I think, three members. They had other commitments. And, um, and they did take the time to let us know. Uh, 
and I'm sure they'll be sorry that they missed the presentations. We thank you very, very much. Courtney, how, how do you, I know you were concerned particularly about students, kids, school kids, and the library opening, libraries opening up. Um, I'm sure it's good news. Unmute myself. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, and I think. Listen, I, um, uh, I, uh, I think we'll do. We'll we'll figure out, and we can reach out to you separately to see if, how we can be helpful um, for you, and if we can be helpful um, to find some ways to to make sure that the message gets out to the organizations that we talked about tonight. Um, and if you there are connections that we need to make, we can do that as well. Um, so we'll reach out separately to you on that. So thank you, and then a lot of this information for the DNS. We very helpful and as and as Blanche is very timely since we are uh, about to be in the thick of the DNS process so um, this is really helpful and I'm, I'm grateful for your insights and I'm grateful for your specificity as well um, which is really wonderful as we craft that uh, as we craft that document. <laughs> um, okay you know you're all welcome to stay on online with us we're going to go into some committee business. I'm not sure quite what, um, just some announcements. And if any committee member wants to bring up any new business, I would just ask if there are any, because our meet and greet didn't quite work out as we had expected. Uh, um, Kirsten, I see you are here. Are there any other new members or prospective members that we want to point out. Um, I thought I ben was, ben was on, but he looks like he had to drop off. I know I spoke to him earlier ben today. So I, is that uh, ben Benjamin? Wu? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so okay. he was on earlier, but I had spoken to him earlier, so I knew he was going to be on, but also had uh, okay. might have to drop off. So okay. Um, so to the new and prospective new person, Kirsten, I um, well, think kindly of us is all I can say. Um, any other committee business? Um, I, while we have Robert on the line, and again, just thank you to all of our guest speakers. While we have Robert on the line, I, um, I just wanna flag that we do have the DNS coming up. And Roberta, correct me if I'm wrong, we want to use next month's meeting in part to go over the the draft of it is that correct no. do i have the timeline well you should finish the draft by next month but you, right. you need to vote on the draft you just need to send it to us but okay but we don't but need to vote on it next month you need to vote on your budget priorities next so month. if bloomingdale is budget priority if 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 um extra staffing is a budget priority that should be voted on at the next okay. um the july meeting so uh, I'm there if you can get any information to um, Courtney and Blanche vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, budget items, whether it's expense or capital budget, that would be a big help. Yeah, we'll we'll embark on that same that process very soon. Like I said, we're still waiting on the budget, which is right. for lack of a. a no, we understand that exactly. Uh, but yeah, as soon as as soon as that's out, you will you will definitely get that information from you. We can tweak it in in September if we need to, but we're mm -hmm. hoping that you know it a, a baseline at least is established in at the um, I'm sorry the July meeting right because. We hope to vote on it at our September full board meeting, but tweak it in, again until if we need to in October. So I, I know things are in flux. So the more you can get to us, the, the better it is. But yeah, this has been a, this has been so helpful. I'm Courtney, glad to hear that. Thank you, Amir, Courtney, Blanche, and all of the librarians. We really appreciate it. Okay, thank you all. Um, any new business? Um, Lance, I just can I, to... Lance, could I just jump in for a quick second on that? Um, we have been in discussion with some of the folks who provide, to going back to a meeting a couple of meetings ago, the DYCD funded programs, um, which are traditionally things that we also highlight in the DNS and want to support. Um, 
the mayor announced today, um, if I understood him correctly, um, that uh, that summer youth employment is going to be returning to something approximating the, the numbers they had pre-pandemic, which is a good thing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, uh, I'm not certain where we are in the budget with um, with the um, Compass and Sonic and Cornerstone and Beacon programs. Um, so maybe we should wait on that until we have some semblance of what the final budget is before trying to figure out what our priorities are there. Um, with the, the, the budget committee is, is encouraging fewer enumerated priorities. So if, if it looks like the, the, the budget for uh, the coming year will already adequately handle some of those things, maybe we wanna consolidate our requests into those that may not be as well thought of or well funded. If, if, even if well, we don't know, even if we don't know, I, 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 I really want this committee to focus on the things that are important because it, it is so important for us to have the things that, that we believe in and the, the things that are part of our core principles. So e even if certain things are restored or not restored, we still need to, have to go forward saying these are, the, these are our core beliefs. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just want to say uh, an extra little thank you to Julian, who stepped up to take minutes tonight. Yeah. Our, our and minute, Blanche. Yes? No, go ahead. I, I was going to say our um, um, minute taking schedule has been thrown off kilter for a number of reasons. And people have been very kind and gracious in stepping up. And we may be, well, we will have to redo the schedule a bit, but we, we, as you can see, remain flexible, as do you, and we appreciate it, but you'll hear a little bit more about that. Okay, um, yeah. Kristen's Courtney. got her hand up. Yeah, Kristen's got her hand up. Okay. Yeah, I have um, a question to about the district needs statement and how you're, you build it out. So it sounds like a draft comes to each committee in July to be voted and approved and then goes to the full board in September. No, 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 no the, the, we don't vote on the draft. A draft comes in, the, the uh, budget and strategy committee uh, creates, creates a, a, a district need statement. We need all the information by July, but we don't, you actually don't vote on it, you just create it. What we do vote on is budget and, and budget items, both expense budget and capital budget. And, and this year, we're only going to have a certain number of budget items and a certain number of expense items, and the rest will just go into a rolling. So in the, in the past, what we've done is at one of our meetings in the fall, we voted on expense budget at priorities and we voted on expense budget, capital budget uh, and expense budget priorities for, for a gazillion items. This year we're voting on just 15 and then we're going to uh, put the others in a letter. So for example, if it's, if it's library items, we'll send an email to, to the libraries and say, these are our top items and these are also our items. If it was Department of Transportation, we'll say, these were our four or five items that were important, but these are the other items that are also important. So to build out the needs statement part, aside from just the budget items, I presume you, that's done by online, each committee. If you look online, you can see our district needs. I've read statement. it, yeah. Okay. Um, and so uh, I'm what just- we're asking this year, because We've never had a pandemic in, in our lifetime. I mean, there was one many, many years ago, but not in our lifetime. We're looking at things diff slightly differently this year. So some things may, may be more important because we, we never had offline learning before. Children were in school or they weren't in school. You know, so there yeah, may be- Yeah, I understand. It's a, it's a pressing year. Just yeah. as far as establishing what needs 
we're Kristen, I think the um, answer, Kristen, I think the answer to your question is that there have been some conversations that folks on this committee and also um, uh, the chairs have been having with stakeholders in our district. And that's gonna feed into that document that I think we talk about at our July meeting. And then right. secondarily, I think it also comes from our meetings that we've had this year. Um, for example, conversations like this, where we've been asking about district needs. We had one um, on youth programming and services a couple of months ago, where we also started to talk about it. So I think the answer is some of it is already in progress, which is I think is why what's driving your question, um, that you haven't actually seen the work that's already been happening. But I think that's what's underlying what's gonna come through next month. Okay, and the committee chairs will put together the part that will come through next month. Correct. Thank you. That's what I want to know. Okay. Courtney, anything on your side there? I'm good. Good. Um, Mark, any comments? You guys did great. Okay. And we... Um... Or Blanche took longer to get into the meeting than the meeting took. <laughs> no. And I still didn't get into the, the first meeting. I, but we're uh, my, happy you got in. My computer often gives, well, it has a mind of its own, but tonight I saw things that I have never, ever seen before. And um, I guess I'll have to look into it, um, I guess. I, I resist the computers, but anyway. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, our... Our, our special guests, you have made our meeting and you made good work for us. We thank you. And um, to be sure, we will be in touch uh, very shortly. Um, but any other comments from the committee members before we adjourn? Great meeting. Oh. Okay. And timely. Wow. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And see you uh, in, in, in July. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Take care.